Hi, I'm Alex Midrigan. Let's have our devotion. We're in Acts chapter 15, beginning in verse 22. Then the apostles and the elders with the whole church decided to select men who were among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, both leading men among the brothers. They wrote, From the apostles and the elders, your brothers, to the brothers and sisters among the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia, greetings. Since we have heard that some without our authorization went out from us and troubled you with their words and unsettled your hearts, we have unanimously decided to select men and send them to you along with our dearly beloved Barnabas and Paul, who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we have sent Judas and Silas, who will personally report the same things by word of mouth. For it was the Holy Spirit's decision and ours not to place further burdens on you beyond these requirements, that you abstain from food offered to idols, from blood, from eating anything that has been strangled, and from sexual immorality. You will do well if you keep yourselves from these things. Farewell. Okay, so here's the letter that's being sent by the Jerusalem Council to the Gentile believers. And they've deviated from the gospel. They compromised. The original question that brought everybody to Jerusalem was, do you need to be circumcised and adhere to the law of Moses in order to be saved? That's what some were insisting upon. These are the Judaizers, whom Paul will call the mutilators of the flesh. But now they end up compromising at the behest of one of our brothers. James ends up speaking up, sharing what happened through Simeon. And at first he sounds great when he speaks directly from Amos 9. And he sounds great when in verse 19 he said, therefore in my judgment we should not cause difficulties for those among the Gentiles who turn to God. That's sound thinking. Don't put difficulty between people and being saved. What does he do then? He goes on to put up some difficulty, excluding, of course, the call of sexual morality as sin. I say this because I know that God's character remains unchanged from the Old Testament to the New. Sexual morality is still sexual immorality. But he includes Old Testament dietary laws, and they make it into the letter that is sent from the Jerusalem Council to Antioch. Jerusalem was the birthplace of the church, largely Jewish, and then Antioch was a Gentile city that had blown up in recent time as, as the Holy Spirit had poured out, as they fled the persecution that began with the martyrdom of Stephen. And now this letter has its outcome described in tomorrow's text. Don't add on to the gospel. Don't make it more difficult for people to believe and be saved. Don't compromise the gospel in that you try to lower the bar, as it were. Don't confess Jesus as Lord. Just make Jesus your friend, <laughs> right? That would be compromising with the gospel and lowering the bar. But also don't raise the bar. Confess Jesus as Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and read all of the Life Application Bible and you will be saved, all right? That would be adding on to it. Don't, don't obfuscate the gospel in any way. If you have personal convictions, praise God, that's great. Okay, if you have a personal conviction against eating meat, for example, rock on, you do you. But the book of Galatians is very clear. The book of Acts is very clear. The New Testament is very clear that these dietary restrictions don't last, that they're atoned for in the work of Christ upon the cross. But if you have a personal conviction against eating meat, then by all means, all right, abstain to the glory of God. In fact, if you have this conscientious objection against eating meat and you eat meat, you sin. Okay, Paul will describe this later on. But don't hold other people to your own personal convictions, especially if they are extra biblical, meaning they're not explicitly written in the Bible. Romans 10, 9, I've said it a billion times. It's the one verse in the Bible that says, if this, then you will be saved. And it sits atop a mountain of soteriology, God electing Israel so that through Jesus, Gentiles could now be saved. It says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's the only if-then statement of the whole Bible that says, if this, then you will be saved. And there's nothing in there about eating meat. There's nothing in there about abstaining from alcohol. There's nothing in there about even being baptized. There's nothing in there about speaking in tongues. There's nothing in there about adhering to a certain soteriology. There's nothing in there about even planting oneself in a certain camp along debates within Christianity along theological lines. Like there's, there's nothing in there about the fine-tuned points 
points of, say, complementarianism and egalitarianism. There's nothing in there. It just says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So Christian, don't add to or take away from the gospel. You didn't write it. Be a faithful messenger with it. Learn from the mistakes and, and observe tomorrow and tomorrow's devotion the outcome of this letter. This is one of the first letters ever written by elders from one church to another, and there are errors in it. <laughs> so, with clear consciences, preach the gospel and the pure gospel and nothing but the gospel, my friend. I'll see you tomorrow.